Oh, I need a couple more days to talk about this. What I'm saying is very deep. You've got to really think about this. When a man finds his niche, when he finds his purposeful life, everything comes alive. He feels important without anyone's approval. When a man finds his work, he doesn't need buddies to make him feel good. Oh, I'm talking now, see. When a man discovers his gift, his work, he doesn't need to hang out with the boys anymore. He found his fulfillment in his work. The male's esteem is in his work. A man finds his sense of importance and significance in his work. I love what Jesus did. The Bible says, Jesus said these words over and over again. He says, I came to do the work my Father sent me to do. It is my work to work the work the Father sent me to do. I came to finish the work the Father sent me to do. I have fulfilled your work, O oh Lord. I came to work. My Father is working. I am always working. Work, 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 work. That's why Christ was completely fulfilled. He was in his work. Now, let me give you something that's very interesting. Work and women. Write this down. This is very important to every man. I want to show you the relationship between a woman and your work. And here's why you got all your problems with ladies. I'm about to give you some solutions. Number one, the male was given work before a woman. In other words, <laughs> you're supposed to already know your vision for your life before you marry a woman. Eve met Adam with two things. One, in God's presence. And two, working. Help me, Lord. I'm going to say it again. The woman's supposed to meet you with two things. One, in God's presence. And two, working. Remember, working is not something you do, it's something you are becoming. You already know what you were born to do. You're becoming your purpose. Now you're ready for a woman. I'm going to explain to you why in a minute. God made work more important for a male than woman. Why? Number two, the woman was created to help the man. Oh dear, it's getting quiet now. The Bible says... I will make for him a helper. Now, if someone coming to help you, you must be doing something. Some of you men took a beautiful lady out of her parents' home. <laughs> She had her own bed in that house, refrigerator, car, food in that house, but you, trying to be a man, told her to come and follow you and marry you, and you took her out of her parents' home and tell her come to live with you, and the Bible says she was created to help you, and she married you, and you ain't doing nothing. Come on, let's talk, guys. Let's talk. I feel an anointing flowing already. I, I feel something happening here. See, let me tell you something. Some of you think the woman is the problem. Let me tell you something, more women. Now, notice God. God says, I will make for him a helper. That means when God pulled that piece out of the man, the word in the Hebrew is he built. Now, when he, when he says the male, it says he formed. To form means to carve. To build is different. It means to shape. That's why women are... When it came to the male, God just went... Women, he went...
I know that this is why a male finds it very difficult to let a woman walk past without him looking. She is still. That's why I can't understand how any man could be attracted to me. Look at this. This is crazy. <laughs> and if you notice, God made the male with no entrance anywhere. See? No entrance. That's an exit. No entrance. God says, it is not good for this man to be alone. I will make for him what? A helper. Now listen to me, guys. That means when God was building the woman, listen carefully, everything he built in her, intellect, intuition, intelligence, skill, planning, wisdom, ideas, you know, all kinds of wonderful suggestions, all that equipment. Everything she has is for you, dummy. <laughs> now listen to me. This is why most men need teaching. Because when you meet a woman, she comes equipped. But when the man sees her, he is threatened because... He ain't got no project for her to work on. You getting it? So here comes this woman with all kinds of PhDs, master's degrees, intelligence, intuition, ideas, wisdom, goals, plan, all the strategy. And she comes and she says, hi there. And you become intimidated by the thing that was made just for you. And what do you do? You call her aggressive. She ain't aggressive. She's equipped. You call her aggressive because you don't know what to do with the equipment. You know, most men marry women like company hire people. Sometimes you hire a person and then don't give them anything to do. <laughs> That's the most frustrating thing in the world is to hire someone and don't tell them what to do. Listen carefully. This is very important. That is why the first thing God gave the male was work. Because when a man discovers his work, now he's ready for a woman who comes to help him with the work. Now, if a woman marries a man and he doesn't know his own vision, his own work, then he has brought frustration in the house. Write this down. A woman needs the male's work to be fulfilled. She's a helper. Oh, by the way, remember about 15 years ago, I was teaching this principle to someone, uh, a group of people in uh, Malaysia. And after I finished it, I was talking to some of the men afterwards. And the Lord showed me something. He says, look, he says, a helper, follow this now. He says, a helper comes to help you. Now, if I want to lift this podium, and I need help, I either need someone just as strong as me, or stronger. Am I right? I'm trying to lift this. I need help. In other words, we think the woman is the weaker vessel. The woman 
word weaker in the Bible used once for women, it means delicate. It doesn't mean no strength. The helper has to be either just as strong or stronger to help you with your work. Men consider women a threat because the men don't have any work for the woman to do. So what do you have? Number four, the woman is equipped to help the man with his work, his vision. And the woman needs a man who knows his work. I advise women all the time, I said, look, if a man wants to marry you, your first question is not, do you love me? Wrong question. Why? Because that's not the first thing God gave the male. The first question a woman should ask a man who wants to marry him is, where are you going? I want to know your future. Show me your vision on paper. Why? You asking me to follow you. I want to know where you're going. What are we going to do together? Work before woman. Vision before woman. Assignment before woman. Your vision is the key to the woman's fulfillment. My wife is the happiest woman in the world. So when she met me, I was already in my work. When a man has found his work, he secures the peace of the woman. A woman doesn't come to compete with you. She came to complete you. Now let me tell you something about, 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 about women. Because God equipped them to help, and they come into your life, if you ain't doing nothing, they're going to help themselves. They're going to start their own businesses, they're going to start their own projects, start their own ministry, because you ain't doing nothing. You know what your wife is waiting for? A plan. When you leave this conference, you need to go home with a vision for your family. Tell your wife, honey, I got a job, but I'm working on my work right here. I got this idea. I'm going to, I'm going to, and by the way, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, a female is an incubator. I mean, the woman, whole entire body is an incubator. God designed them that way. That's why whenever you give a woman, you never get it back the way you gave it. You know, an incubator is an amazing thing. Whatever you put in an incubator is multiplied, is given life, and it gives it back to you. Let me say it again. Whatever you put in, in an incubator, it always multiplies whatever you give it. It gives it life, and it gives it back to you. Incubators never keep anything. They always take it in, multiply it, make it bigger, give it life, and give it back to you. So, that's why. If you give a woman a sperm, she doesn't get a sperm back, she multiplies it, gives it life, gives you a baby. You give her a house, she multiplies it, gives you a home. You give her groceries, she multiplies it, gives it life, and gives you a meal. <laughs> you give her a word, she multiplies it, she gives you a sentence. Okay. So, you give her frustration, multiply it, she gives you hell. You can always tell what you're giving a woman by what she's giving back to you. Incubator. She came into your life to what? Help. Write this down. The woman is frustrated by a man who doesn't know his vision, his work in life. Doesn't know what he's becoming. That's why I appreciate manpower. Manpower is us hiding away for a couple of days and trying to grapple with these basic issues so we can save our women from frustration. 
We need to be honest with ourselves. Saying, I don't know what I'm doing. Your job is not your work. You gotta find that work. Find out what is my assignment? What am I born? What am I born to do? That's what a woman is looking for. I put it to you. That the most important discovery of a male is his work. Because work is the purpose for your existence and purpose is the source of your vision. Now, vision is an amazing thing. Vision gives the male a sense of meaning in life. If you know where you're going, you have a sense of security and a sense of passion. Matter of fact, vision provides security and meaning for the female also. Because when she relates to you, she came into your life to help you do what you're doing. You should never marry a woman if you don't know where you're going. That's abuse of a woman. She came to help you. Help you with what? Is the question. And that's why these days are so important together. We cannot go into the next century with confused men. Your wife, your wife is quiet, but she is quietly frustrated because you, you wouldn't tell her what we're doing. What are we doing in this house? She needs you to find your vision for her own sanity. Proverbs 29 says, where there is no vision, the family perish. You know, I could, I could clearly say that Mistress Jake is a happy woman. She was with us today, she's serving us lunch, and she was so happy serving us lunch. Why? She's in the middle of her husband's dream. Now, she has a dream, but her dream is that it is in, within his dream. There's no competition, no jealousy. She's happy. Why? He has provided a place for her to flourish. Hmm. I told my wife the other day, I said, you know, if you go to work, you can make somebody else rich. See, my well stay with me, work with me, and make me rich. And when I'm rich, you're rich. What if your wife go to work? It's a question. What is your plan to start your own business so she can become a part of your dream and help you fulfill the family's dream? Write this down. Jobs prepare you for your work. You were never supposed to die on a job. You're supposed to die in your work. Jobs are always temporary. Work is permanent. They can fire you from a job. They can't fire you from your work. Your wife needs security. And work is security. put it to you. The vision is personal but never private. Do you see it there? It says, where there is no vision, what? The people perish. It never says where there is no husband or no leader. Where there is what? No vision. People perish. Vision is more important than the person. Yes, you're a good man. You're a wonderful guy. But do you have a vision for the family? Is the question. Can you show me a 50-year plan on paper for your family right now. Fifty years. I have one. Can your son say to your daddy, is this where we're going? I'm going to go to college and get education to help you get there. You even give your children purpose when you find your own vision. Look at that verse again. Where there is no what? Vision, you affect all the people. 
This is, is not private. It affects everybody. Therefore, vision is a source of self-control. It keeps you on one path. Vision is also the key to personal and corporate discipline. It helps you discipline your life. And I want to close on this because it's very important for men to understand the power of vision. I am very concise in my life. I know exactly what to do every day. Do you want to be mentored by a world-renowned leader of leaders? Are you ready to be inspired to pursue your personal development goals? Then pursue higher learning through the Miles Monroe Leadership Mentoring Program. Dr. Miles Monroe offers a 12-month distance education experience, providing personal mentoring for persons who are ready to release and maximize their leadership potential. As I started the mentorship program, uh, it wasn't easy. It's not an easy program. And it is not something that you can just do in a day or two days. Success doesn't come, there's a process. So I just truly know that what I've gotten is a release of my gift. I understand who I am, I understand what I'm called for, and I understand that God is in control. It's been a wonderful experience, and my ministry, Soup for Life, was birthed out of this mentorship program because it helped to give me direction and helped me discover what discover uh, my true purpose in it. Membership benefits include monthly letters from Dr. Monroe, a place on Dr. Monroe's prayer list, monthly resources, opportunities to travel with Dr. Monroe, 50% discount on Miles Monroe books used in the program, and much more. Registration for the new semester is now open. Contact a mentorship team member today and find out how you can become a part of this life-changing mentorship experience. Call 242-461-6474 or email us at mentor at milesmonroeleadership.com. All persons interested in mentorship are asked to sign up today at the mentorship desk at the back of the sanctuary. Six. 0.7 billion of us human beings have one thing in common. We will confront change. It's time to embrace change by purchasing a copy of Dr. Miles Monroe's book, The Principles and Benefits of Change. Discover the purpose of change. Manage change. Maximize critical change. Rediscover the impact of change. Learn how to respond to change. Protect yourself against change. Develop change strategies to chart your course to a preferred future. To print a copy of this book, call 1-242-461-6400. Or visit us on the World Wide Web at bfmnm.com. If you want to become an agent of change, get your copy of the principles and benefits of change today. The world is in a global crisis. Natural forces are threatening human welfare. There is exploding. But there is hope. The kingdom of God is never in crisis. It's time to overcome personal and global crisis and learn the secrets to thriving in challenging times by purchasing a copy of Dr. Miles Monroe's book, Overcoming Crisis. Learn how to overcome the seasons of crisis. Rise Above Crisis, Strategies to Managing Crisis, The Kingdom Deployment, The Seed Principle, The Management Mandate, Maximize the Benefits of Crisis, and Discover Your Work Beyond Your Job. To purchase a copy of this book, call 1-242-461-6400 or visit us on the World Wide Web at bfmnm.com. You do not have to live in crisis. You can overcome it. Get your copy of Overcoming Crisis today. Webster defines the word partner as one who has part share in a business. Our business? The kingdom. Webster also defines partnership as a business association between two or more people where the profits are shared. The King James Bible, Matthew 6, verse 10, states, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you consider me a partner, welcome his kingdom as you would welcome me. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, paraphrase says, I am your partner and a fellow worker among you. As for you, my brethren, we are representatives of the church and an honor to Christ. 
let us join forces as we partner together in establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. Because, Because the kingdom, kingdom is in you. open game. Anybody can run your life. Matter of fact, without a vision, you can be led by good things that are not right things. And good is not always right. Let me put it this way. Purpose precedes vision. That's why I give you, God gives you purpose first. And purpose for your life is the source of your vision. That's where it comes from. And purpose is the foundation of your vision. That's where you get it built from. And purpose produces your vision. Vision is purpose when you can see it. Can you see the apple tree in the sea? Absolutely. Vision is a manifestation of your purpose. Vision is also the glimpse of your purpose. When you see it in pictures, vision is a conceptual reality of your purpose for living. Vision is purpose in technicolor. All of you have seen your purpose, but you can't believe that's you. Because your society tells you don't think that big. That's why God sent me to tell you, believe what you're dreaming. I put it to you then that vision is God's deposit of his purpose in your heart. He puts it there for you. Vision is purpose and pictures. Vision is a view of your end at the beginning. Vision is there for you looking at your future. From it comes your passion. A man who knows his work and his purpose doesn't go home and sit on, in television, watching television with a bear in his hand for five hours. A man who has vision for his life doesn't spend his time just hanging around with the boys shooting pool. So vision makes you a disciplined man. I put it to you that vision is a preview of your finished future. It's already finished. That's why it looks so beautiful. And it gives you the incentive to move toward that passion. Therefore, vision is seeing your true self and your true self concept. You see yourself as God sees you in the end. There's a verse of scripture that changed my life. And it, it talks about God setting your end before the beginning. God wants you to have sight, but never live by your sight. The greatest gift God ever gave man is not the gift of sight, but the gift of vision. Why? Because the enemy of vision is sight. Sight is a function of the eye, but vision is a function of the heart. Never trust your eyes over your vision. Vision shows you what could be. Sight shows you what is. Always live by what you see with your vision, not with your eyes. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Vision contradicts your eyes. I know things don't look good right now, but God has sent me and, and Bishop Jake's 
and brother love to tell you look hold your head back up this crisis cannot last your vision is more real than your present reality don't trust your eyes you were not created to live by your eyes but by your vision that's why your hope can come from your vision the reason why Barack Obama won the election is because he kept talking about a future he used the word hope you know uh, whether you uh, against him or for him it doesn't matter he won <laughs> why? He was selling the most powerful thing in life. Vision. Hope. Vision is the source of confidence. Joel says these words. It shall come to pass. When I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Why? So they can jump and run around a building and fall on the floor. Some of y'all are running tonight. What's the purpose for the Holy Spirit? It's a very important question. Why should He anoint you? What's the reason for sending the Holy Ghost back to earth? What did Adam lose? Are you thinking with me? Jesus gave the disciples the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm going to give it back to everybody. What does the Holy Spirit bring back to man? Not a thrill, not a shout. He says, he's coming back with two things. If you are old, he'll give you back your dream. If you are young, he'll give you back your vision. No matter what you say about this conference, how anointed it was, how the power of God was there, and the presence of God was there, the question is, did you leave here with a dream or a vision? That's evidence that the Holy Ghost was here. Wow. No matter how much you tell me that you're being baptized in the Holy Spirit, the result should be a clear vision for your life. Now notice it says the old man shall what? Dream, dream. Now here's why. The difference between a dream and a vision is very interesting. A dream is a vision that cannot come, pa- come to pass in your lifetime. So it's called a dream. Let me say it again. A dream is a vision that cannot come to pass in your lifetime. So it's a, it's a dream. It's still a vision, but it's a dream. A dream is a vision that cannot be accomplished in your lifetime. So you pass it on to the next generation. If you are young, it's a vision. Why? So you're so young, you can actually complete it in your lifetime. So whether you are old or young, it doesn't matter. He gives you both back vision. And one of the things he said that blew my mind, and listen to this as we prepare to bring this to a conclusion. He says, the handmaidens shall prophesy. The women shall prophesy. This is very interesting. Bishop, listen to this. When I did my research on this verse, it was shocking. It actually has a strange con- context in the Hebrew. It says, if you're young, you will have revelation, you'll see the future. If you're old, you'll see the future. But if you are a female, you will repeat the future. Now, when I looked up the, the context of the word, here's what it means. When a man tells a woman his vision, she incubates it. And every time she sees him, she tells him what he he told her back to him. This is deep. That's why it is called prophesying. 
See, you told your wife. God told me to build this ministry. God told me, God told me. She said, okay, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then after about two years, you get discouraged. You say, this is, this, I, I think I missed God. She says, now wait a minute. Didn't you tell me that God told you that this is my Now, most men, when the wife comes back and prophesies back to them what they told the wife, the men call it nagging. God calls it prophecy. Don't tell her shut up. She's doing her job. She's telling you what you told her God told you. Give God a hand for good women. Come on, give God a hand for good women. Praise God. So, sit down for one second. Listen to this. The purpose, therefore, for the Spirit is to restore man to his vision and to his dream. I want to pray and transfer the Spirit of vision upon every man here tonight. But I want to show you why your vision is so important. Isaiah says, I am God, and there's none like me. I am God, and I said the end before the beginning. I say from ancient times what is yet to come. I say my purpose will stand. As we conclude this, I want you to take a look at what God is saying here. God says, I said the end before the beginning. And I say from ancient times, what is yet to come? I say my purpose will stand. Look at me for a second. God says, look, I set the end of your life first. I finish it first. And then I back up and I begin your life. Watch him now. He says, he set the end first. Then he begins. So whenever God begins something, that is evidence it's finished. So God doesn't allow anything to begin unless it's already finished. So when your father released the sperm in your mother's womb, six Hundred million sperm dashed toward the egg in your mother, and God had to pick through six hundred million sperm, and He said, "I want that one." Guess who that was? That was you. Why? He says, uh, "What I finished, I wanted to start now. I'm gonna give him birth now. Your birth is evidence that there's something already finished that you were born to start." That's why the next verse says, he makes known the end at the beginning. He will show you your end at your beginning. Okay. This is too wonderful. So, God says, look, I'm going to finish you first, then I'll start you. And when I start you, I'll show you your finish. So, that's why you walk around every day with this big dream of what you want to do. That's your end. Now, at the beginning, you're broke. But at the end, you're by time millionaire. And you can see the million while you are broke. Now, you got to understand, God won't allow you to see what is not there. So once you see it, that's a fact. The distance between what you see and where you are is called the plan. So it's important to you as a man to see your end, 
if you meet a woman at the beginning, don't tell her what you have at the beginning. You ain't got nothing. Show her what you will have at the end and tell her, help me get there, baby. Help me get there, baby. Help me get there, baby. When my wife married me, I was broke in college, had nothing, but I told her my dream, and she believed in my dream more than my pocketbook. And now, wow, she didn't know she was getting married to a multi-millionaire. I want you to go home and get your dream and vision on paper and tell your wife, baby, stay with me long enough. Because I promise you, if you stay with me long enough, <laughs> you are going to have your own feet in your own jet. Oh, come on, man, dream with me just a little bit. We're going to have five houses on lease. We're going to travel around the world together, sharing God's word. Just stay with me. I know my church only got 50 members now, baby. But I promise you, if you stay with me, God showed me 50,000. Stand up on your feet. Never judge a man at his beginning. Because the beginning is always small. The Bible says the end of a thing is greater than its beginning. You need to find your work. Let's hold hands together. Joseph saw his end when he was a teenager. And Joseph believed his end so much, he started talking about it. Let me say this to you. You don't believe it until you start talking about it. <laughs> and let me tell you something. You can always tell when a vision is from God. It makes you look like a fool. If they believe you the first time you tell them, it's not from God. Yeah. Because the end is always so m amazing. Every vision only has one believer first. Sometimes you've got to convince yourself. Like, like Abraham and Joseph. Have to be convinced. But once you've seen it, it takes over your life. Joseph went and told his daddy, I saw myself sitting on a throne. You and all my brothers were kneeling before me. And I was sustaining you. I'm the youngest in the family, but I'm going to feed everybody. His brother says, are you crazy? If they don't think you're crazy, it's not a vision from God yet. His father says, son, is that what you see? I believe it with you. He put it in his heart. That's why we're here tonight. Bishop Jakes and myself and the others who are here with you this week, we're like 
We're just like Jesus, Father. We believe you. We believe you. You can tell us your craziest dream. We believe you. Because we were crazy too. And then Joseph brothers couldn't handle the dream. He turned his clothes off. He threw him in the pit. I imagine Joseph in the pit. Looking at the dirt. Looking up, seeing the sky. It's dirt. And Joseph decides to sit down in the pit. And Joseph, the Bible didn't say about his attitude. He never got angry. You know what I believe Joseph did in that pit? What I want you to do tonight. Joseph sat in that pit and Joseph said, You know something? This is not what I saw. Listen to me. If what you see is not what you saw, then what you see is temporary. Your neighbor, this ain't what I saw. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Keep holding hands for a minute. So here you are, working for someone. You're going to go back to work on Monday. I want you to go to the job and smile. Have a good time, walk in and say, good morning, everybody. How you all doing? And they say, why are you so happy? Tell them, this ain't what I saw. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> yeah, it's called temporary employment. I know you're going back to a house. Maybe even it's close to foreclosure. You know why God sent me here tonight? Just to tell you this. The reason why he can let them foreclose on this one. Because this ain't the one you saw. <laughs> yes, I know your church is in the storefront. But that ain't what he showed you when you was on your pillar. So tell the people, let's enjoy this place while we're here. This ain't what we saw. We're on our way to something greater. Let's enjoy where we are. Because this is not permanent. It's temporary. Ow! Oh! oh, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all came here and you wanted to give some money so bad tonight. You say, oh, I wish I had a thousand dollars. And God told me to tell you tonight, yes, I know you wanted to give it. He said, but you're, you've got a little difficulty financially now. But this is not what you saw. <laughs> Joseph said, this is, I saw myself on a throne. So I'll just relax. Keep holding hands. Oh, listen to me. When I went to Egypt for the first time, we went to the San Yai Desert excursion. My wife and I, it was amazing. And they showed us how the Egyptians used to keep their silos in the, in the desert. And my guy said to me, he says, you know, there's a... A merchant road that runs from Egypt all the way to Syria, all the way through Israel, up to Syria. And he said, that's where they used to bring all the trade down from Syria 
in Chippen Africa. And he said, do you remember Joseph? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you see, when the brothers took Joseph, are you ready? And they, they took him to the, the desert and they threw him in the pit. He said, it had to be one of the pits right next to the highway where the merchant caravans would be coming all the way down from Syria going to Egypt to do business. He said, and they had to have thrown him in the right pit, right next to the highway. Oh, Jesus, how crazy. He said, it was the right pit because it was the pit that the caravans had to pass. And when the men, the brothers saw the caravan, they took him out of the pit and sold him on the side of the road to the caravan. And I thought, that's amazing. He was in the right pit, next to the right highway, because the free transfer, transportation that he needed to take him to the throne was coming that same highway. I've come to tell you that even you are stuck in a job, it's a pit. Somebody is on the way, coming to pick you up, to take you to your destiny. They're going to take you there.